testing and save. Hello. 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 Let's wait another minute or two to see if anybody will join us before we start. Okay, it looks like this may be what we have for the beginning. Um, so let's get started. Um, there are a couple of announcements before we do. The, you know, most of you are San Diego State students, um, with a couple exceptions. The fall schedule for registration has started today. Um, and last couple of days, there have been a few changes made to the fall schedule um, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, we're all dealing with this, you know, stay at home, um, don't go out, shut down businesses situation. And it does have, you know, some long term effects. A uh, <clears throat> couple of, like, an effect San Diego State. Uh, in the fall semester, you know, one is the, you know, San Diego State is state supported. Um, so we get a lot of, you know, funding from the state. And the state is anticipating a major drop in revenues uh, because businesses aren't selling stuff. And so there's no sales taxes going to be down. Uh, people are laid off, so they're not earning money. So Income tax is going to be greatly reduced. Um, businesses aren't making money, so 
taxes on business are going to go way down. Um, plus expenses are going to go up for the state. So San Diego State is starting to prepare for um, a slim budget next year. Also, um, we anticipate that the enrollments will be down next year because um, students, you know, depending on jobs, the parents' jobs, or their jobs to fund their education, and those jobs may no longer exist. So they may be laid off. So they don't have the money, um, and so students may be postponing coming to school or going to um, cheaper alternatives. And for the computer science department, we have a fair number of students from India and the new graduate students who admitted from India may not be able to make it in the fall. Um, so those two things, um, campus is worried that we'll have um, some classes which will be very, very small. So they've asked us to identify classes which would be um, potentially have a small enrollment and take them off the schedule at least temporarily until we know more about enrollments and budgets. Um, so a number of classes were taken off the schedule at least temporarily. Um, there's also a couple of classes on the fall schedule that were don't have we haven't identified instructors yet. And we don't know if we'll be able to pay instructors if we can get them. So they are um, the schedule numbers hidden, so you can't register for them. As far as the College of Science Studies courses, or as their new name is now the World Campus, um, you know, those courses are self funded, which means we don't. They don't receive any state funds and the student tuition has to pay for all expenses of these courses. Um, so we're not affected by the, uh, well, those courses are not affected by the state budget going down. Um, but one thing um, which does happen is that in the iPhone, iPad class enrollment um, was not large enough in the fall to fully pay the overhead and other expenses. So this coming fall, instead of teaching a iOS iPad course, I'm going to be teaching a course on um, multi-platform uh, mobile app development. And the schedule is not out yet. Um, we were waiting for the um that course to be approved by the university and the approval came last friday so like um, this week we'll send this fall schedule over to college extended studies so they can put it online um so that's oh uh, one Hi. go ahead um can you say the name of that class again? It's going to be, well, let me, it's going to be called, well, I forget the exact title, but it's going to be um, multi-platform mobile app development. So in this course, right, we're developing applications just for Android, right? Um, using Kotlin. Um, in the iOS course, um, we use Swift to develop iOS um, applications. And so if you're a company that, you know, needs an app, a mobile app, um, at least in this country, you have to support both Android and iOS, which means either you've got two separate teams one doing iOS and one doing Android, or you've got one team that can do both. Um, but regardless, you've got two separate code bases, right? One in Swift and one in Kotlin. And um, 
That means every feature you want to add, you have to do it twice. Um, and the architecture of the two platforms is slightly different. Um, so it becomes fairly costly to report two separate platforms. Um, there are a number of different systems that allow you to use one code base to produce both um, an Android application and an iOS application. And different systems operate differently, so they've got different limitations. Um, so there are a couple I want to look at um, in the fall. One is Flutter. Um, this is comes out of Google, and it currently will produce applications for uh, Android and iOS and um, web applications. Another one is React Native, which again will produce applications for iOS, Android, and the web. Okay, any questions? So we will be eligible for that course. Um, I couldn't quite hear that. So we will be eligible for that course. That course will be for advanced certification in mobile and mobile. Um, yes. Yeah, that course will be available um, for students to take. Um, you know, if you're a CS guide student, it'll count towards your degree. Um, and it'll be a 696 course. So, Professor, I, I only run uh, web and mobile application, so advanced certificate course uh, right now. So, whether I will be eligible for that course? Um, Yes, it's not, we're not building web pages, we're building mobile applications. So yes, you, you can take it, um, um, you know, apply to a certificate and it'll apply to a CF degree. Got you, thank you so much. Okay, so now, um, Next issue is um, what to do with the remaining part of the semester. Um, typically, I have a fourth assignment um, where you connect um, your application talks to a server. Um, one of the problems I have as an instructor um, with the remote teaching is we get far less feedback from the students. Um, you know, just walking into class, um, you can get a lot of information just by looking at students. Often towards the end of the semester, you walk into class and you see students are um, clearly have not had a full night's sleep for a while. Um, so you know that those students are just you know, are being overworked. Um, here, all I see is a list of names. Um, so you could be, you know, watching TV, uh, surfing the web, right? Um, you could fall asleep in the middle of the lecture, and I wouldn't know it. Um, also, you, you know, often, well, you've experienced this every usually. When I ask the questions in class, it's like dead silence, right? Like, mm -hmm. And then as soon as class ends, it was like there's just students you come up and then they start asking questions. Um, so it, it becomes hard to judge what's happening with students. Um, so I don't know what your um, workload is how you're dealing with um, issues of, you know, stay at home, um, don't go anywhere, environment. Um, a few students have contacted me by email. Um, you 
you know, the people who have contacted me were um, feeling a bit overworked, which is not unusual for this part of the semester for a computer science student. So are there any, any comments? I mean, I would think it would definitely be better not, I mean, I guess like this goes with everybody's schedule, but um, I mean, for me, I think it would be easier um, not to have an assignment for, um, also because um, considering that most of our final projects from what I was also hearing last week and based off of our own final project is that most people will probably be communicating with some server and, and using Firebase or whatever it is. So we'll probably be using, you know, server applications in the final project and, um, you know, being able to apply it there. So that's also one reason I think that, you know, we'd also be able to apply it there. Yeah, that's my thinking too, that um, it's probably best given the situation not to have an assignment for and just have students work on projects. Yeah, and I think we'd also be able to implement, I guess, um, probably some of the things that we probably weren't sure that we could implement within the time frame for our final project. but. Um, if we were to not have an assignment for, I think we might be able to take a crack at some of those extra stuff that we wanted to do for our final project. Yeah, so let's go with that. Um, at least one student said they'd prefer to assignment for no project. Um, but I really do prefer students to do projects um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is I find when a student comes up with their own idea, they usually are more enthusiastic about the idea, a little harder. Um, you know, plus, you know, of course, like this, if you want to, when you go on the job market to, to be a mobile web, mobile developer, um, it's it's far more valuable to have a project than to say I did course assignments. Um, you know, some people also might, you know, think about publishing their polishing their application up after the semester is over and submitted to the App Store. Um, and doing that really, really helps. Um, you know, when you apply for jobs in this space, and having an app in the App Store. Um, you know, shows you're a bit more serious and have gone farther than just taking a class. Um, so let's go with no more assignments and go work on the projects. Would the finals, will our final grades just be divided by the total number of points still? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just um, that's the advantage of using a point system. You just, um, instead of a thousand points, maybe there's only 800 points. So. Okay. Now this does lead to um, another thing that typically happens this course is, um, At some point, um, I'll be covering, I've well, I've covered all the topics that you'll be using in your projects. Um, and so if I keep on talking about more topics, then people tend not to be as interested. And in when we were, um, you know, pre-COVID-19, um, when we do this in class, right, you know, by the last two weeks of class, I'd get one or two students showing up. Um, and it's, that was a signal to me that the students were too busy doing stuff. And so typically what I've done this class is the last week or two, 
I stopped lecturing and make turn class into office hours. It also gives you um, more time to work on projects. Um, and so I'll probably do the same thing this semester. I do have a question. Okay. Uh, um, are we having a final? No, the, the project, no, there's no, no final. In this course, I think doing a project is far more valuable than having a final. Sounds good to me. Yeah, students never complain about not having a final. So, Professor, uh, assignment four was the last assignment, or after this, another assignment is there? Um, let me. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah, uh, I'm asking like uh, assignment four was the last assignment for this course, or there is there is assignment five scheduled. Um. Well, so the answer is there's no more assignments. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I think it is a good idea, Professor. We can spend our time uh, on project. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, professor, yeah. uh, regarding, I guess, if we want to do like, um, like show you kind of our final project or maybe go over like some part of it, um, uh, like, is it possible to do like a share screen type of Zoom session? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. And that's, um, so when I stop lecturing, that's what I expect to happen is someone will come in and say, like, I've got this problem, I'm working on this. Um, so yeah, we can use it, you know, so I'll, I'll still be, um, during this time available for you to ask questions, we share screens, et cetera. Okay. Any other questions before we I start lecturing? Okay, so let's, I need to share my screen. And then of course, what happens, I lose various windows. I'm not sure why this happens. No, I need to get my chat window in okay, case so I'm going to ask questions. And okay, it should be good. Um, so, what I want to talk about today is what's now known as um, BAAS, um, which stands for Back End of the Service. The when mobile development became very popular and big, uh, particularly when there were a lot of independent developers and small companies, um, the problem they have is lots of applications need a back end, a server. And you know, if you're an independent developer or, or a small, you know, a team of two or three, um, Oh, yes, yes, again. Just a minute as I look like someone joined us. Do I have? Um, Okay, no, okay. 
you know, whenever I share a screen, I will set an online windows I set up for Zoom change. And I try and keep a window open so my participants in case someone joins late. And get back to normal now. Um, so the problem is, you know, if you're building an application for commercial use, right, that's a, it's a lot, a lot of work. Um, requires a lot of intense work. Um, and developers may not have the time or the expertise to build a backend server to support the level of service they need. Um, right, building a PHP backend uh, may not be able to support the type of service you need or the volume you'll need. Um, so they start up, a lot of companies started building systems that you could use as a backend. Um, and there's a lot of them um, and they come and go, so I haven't, I haven't kept track. Um, uh, and Firebase is perhaps the more common ones. Um, it was a small company and Google bought it out. Uh, and they've actually done a good job. They've, they've added services to it, improved upon it. Um, and for us, um, the big thing is that um, for low volumes is, is free, right? So if you don't have much traffic, which you won't have when you build in your application, um, it's free. And so there's no cost to using it. And you can use it in iOS, Android, and the web. So if you again want to put multiple up platforms, you can do the same back end. Um, and all the data stored is JSON. And there's a bunch of features. Um, we're really mainly interested in, in being able to build this, you know, real-time database that you can access. But eventually, if you build applications, um, you want to deal with messaging, analytics, authentication. Um, if you're dealing with photos or big files, you want the storage, um, and you, you will want crash reporting. So all these features you won't need for project, but when you build an application for real, I mean, it becomes very important. Um, and of course, being able to support ads um, is one common way of earning some money off of applications. So this, we'll start looking at you know, basically a real-time database, first of all. Um, we need to um, you know, download um, the Google Play services, um, what you can do on SDK tools, although um, they have um, improved Android Studio. Um, and most of the things right now is automatically installed for us. Um, So yeah, there's two ways to add Firebase to a project. One is manually. Um, initially, I recommend that because the Android Studio um, has some bugs, but these days, um, man, just use Android Studio. Um, and I'll show you to do that because it's 
You click a few buttons and they install various things you need to install for you. Um, yeah, and again, if you install using Firebase, um, it all, they, they, they install the right versions of various libraries for you. Um, so in Firebase, there's Manu Studio. When you go to the Tools menu, right, um, there is a Firebase um, menu, and that opens up a, a window on the right side of Manu Studio. And for the real-time database, um, you basically click on this link um, and it'll lead you through the operations. Now, I also want to talk about briefly about Firestore. Um, so the real-time database was was a visual, um, you know, Firebase application, and they started a second generation called Firestore. Um, you know, for low volume operations, they're both free, and we'll talk about Firestore a little bit later. Um, yeah, the first time you run this, Android Studio asks for various permissions about your um, Google um, account. Um, yeah, I, I ran through the steps yesterday to see how they were do. They updated things. I wasn't asked this, but I'd already done this before, um, and it's connected to my Google account, so I assume that's why. Um, when you create a Firebase um, database, there's a console you can go to um, that allows you to do various things. One is you set permissions on your database. You can also then examine your database and add to it um, directly from the web if you want. Um, when you go um, in Android Studio, click on the Firebase real-time database. It gives you these steps that you have to go, um, you know, connect to your map to Firebase, um, add a real-time um, database to the app, um, and then tells you how to configure read and write. Um, when you create it for the first time through Android Studio like this, it will um, set the missions to be globally readable and globally writable, make it a little bit easier. Um, you know, said it's going to be restricted, but it, it wasn't this time. And then it gives you, um, you know, some various examples of how you actually write to the database and read from the database. Um, when you connect this Firebase, it's going to ask you for the name of the project. Um, you know, I had some existing project already, so you see the list. Um, now, a year ago when I did this, um, some of the things they added to my project were out of date and it caused me problems. When I did it yesterday, there were no problems. I created a new project in Android Studio. I created a new database in Firebase um, and it all ran perfectly. So I did not have this problem um, currently. So you should be good to go. Um, and so these are the settings I ended up with. Um, we need Google services. Um, why? Well, because um, this is how Google now um, allows updates to, for Android devices. Um, 
I don't have any updates the operating system. And this is what they added um, to my um, Bill Gradle file, the module version. And they also added this plugin. Again, this is all done for me when I went to, to adding Firebase to Android Studio. Um, And one of the steps, what they do is they add a uh, file called googleservices.json, which contains information about your account. So when your application talks to the server, it has the right information. Again, this was added to my project automatically by going through steps through um, Android Studio. Um, If we do it manually, then the, when we go to online, there is a step for downloading the configuration file. Um, but again, if you, if you go through the Android Studio wizard, um, this is done for you. Um, now when you go online to the web browser to the Firebase app page, um, you then get the data. And this, this is showing me the um, current state of my database. And so I just created it. There's no um, data in it. It, um, it should add, um, To the merge manifest file, um, then request to access the internet. Um, like I said, um, when I did it yesterday, it set the read write permissions on my database to be real. Anyone could read to it and write from it just for testing, but. Um, when you're done with development, you really want to lock that down because anyone who can act, if you leave it as read write, will read and writable, um, anyone who connects to your database, even on the web, can modify it. And you know that's a bad idea. Um, so the deal with that, um, when you go online to your database, um, There is like the rules and you know, to make a world read writable, um, you set the rules to be um, read write to be true. Um, so now, um, here is, you know, once you've been set your project up to use Firebase, here is the application to write to Firebase, right? Just hello world. Um, so we need to initialize our database, Firebase app, so it knows um, how to connect to it. Um, we need an instance of our database, which is pretty simple to get, it's just um, get instance on the Firebase database class. Um, and then I get a reference. Um, and when I get a reference like this, the, that string you pass in is the key where your data will be stored. And then when I call set value, you have to say the value to be the whole world. Um, this will now um, open up a connection to the database. It will create um, basically a space in the database to have a key called message and it will store um, the string hello world there.
You don't need to open a socket. You don't need to open up um, verbal network connections. That's all done for you. And even if the um, that key doesn't exist, it will create it for you in the database. So you don't need to populate um, tables, et cetera, on Firebase in advance. Um, your application um, just generates them on the client side when it needs them. This does have one big uh, pitfall. Um, if I type in a string literal like this for the key I'm going to store data in. If I type it wrong, it will not complain. It will not say, I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. It will automatically um, store the data at that key. Um, so you need to be somewhat careful. Um, we'll just re repeat what I just said. Um, and then um, when we go online in the web browser to look at our database, we see that again, we, we do have a key called message. And there is a value there, a little world. And I must say I'm slightly irritated at Zoom right now. Um, in the sense of they kept on sending a message to update my application, so I finally did. Now when I write on the screen, there is a delay. I, can't, I haven't quite figured out how to deal with that, right? Um, the fire, the data in fire da Firebase database is all JSON objects, um, and the database, at least in the original version, is all a single tree, JSON tree. So you build this huge JSON tree up. Um, although in the Firestore, um, they've changed that, so it's not one big JSON tree, which does improve the performance. And since it's JSON, you know, here are all the standard data types you can use for a particular um, value. And the keys are all strings. Right? So our keys for stored data are all strings and they can be up to 768 bytes, which is plenty long enough um, and each node, um, each value at a key can be at most 10 megabytes. And this whole tree structure we build um, can only be 32 levels deep. Again, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big um, tree structure considering that we're not limited to just binary branches. We're gonna have multiple branches. Um, so we can, there's two ways in which we can package data up to go into uh, the Firebase database. One is we can take a Java class. Well, we're using Kotlin, but Kotlin classes are really behind the scenes Java classes. So we can a Kotlin class and then send that um, or we can create a JSON object directly. And the one example I gave you, that's what I did with the JSON object is just a single string. Um, now to do this, um, we need several, do several things. One is we need a default constructor so that um, 
when we grab the information back from Firebase, the object we created for us, and we also either have all the fields or properties public so that Android can pull all the fields out to send it to the um, database. And when we get the data back, to put it in our objects. Either we need all the properties public or we need a getter and setter for each one. Um, so here's an example. Um, class is the person class. Um, and here is an example of you know, first I'm creating two objects. And then I uh, actually, you know, sending to um, All right, so I'm doing several things here. One is I'm getting a reference of type person. So all the data we're going to send to the database will be um, under the key person, um, but then I am actually creating a child. So um, this first value for Alan will be stored under the key person, and then under that person we stored as Alan, and then I store the value of Alan Turing there. And, um, you know, so here is the um, database on the server. Like I said, we first we created person, um, right? And then we created a key, sub key Allen, and then we added in you know, the various fields for that object and each field becomes a a key and the values for those um keys become the values of that key in the database any questions so far No, everyone's sleeping. Um, I'm awake. Okay, good. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, another example, and here I'm going to show you the delay I'm getting. Um, I just drew the line. And now you see it coming up, right? Question in my endpoint. Um, you know, so here I'm getting a reference person slash as slash famous slash Alan. Um, and then I'm creating the person object and then I'm setting the value, right? Um, and then with you know, down to news, I'm showing you a different way of specifying a longer path, um, just getting a reference to the database. And then it's like, oh, go to person, go to CS. And then, you know, famous slash Donald. So there's various ways in which we can specify a path in the database to the data we want to store. Uh, I don't understand the path. Oh, nope. maybe that'll help. <laughs> yeah, here's a, here's the actual database, right? Um, so I said, oh, under person and then CS, right? And then famous. I need to wait for the line to show up. And then there's Alan. So now if we go back, 
right? You can see, right? When I say get the reference, right? I'm saying person, CS famous Allen. Um, now I'm going to go back to the actual database on online. You know, there it is again. Person, CS famous Allen. Make more sense now. Yeah. So when I say path, right, it's this this path that you know. First key, second key, you know, third key nested, fourth key nested. And so if we want to use Firebase, right, um, Firebase is only one big tree structure of JSON objects. Um, so it becomes, um, instead of creating tables like a universal database, yes, yes, the structure of this tree. Um, the title here says it all. Um, if the value already exists and you say right to it, you that's an update. Now I could have done all this by hand instead of using objects. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, you know, again, I'm going to people. Wait for the line to show up. Um, and then under first name, I'm saying John, right? So that, you know, doing John McCarthy, I'm doing everything by hand. And this is fine. People, you know, name, first name with the value. Another way we can do it, which I'm showing you here, is I can create a hash map of the values and then send that to um, Firebase. And now one thing to note, um, notice that when we look at the birth years of the two, one is a string and one's a number. Um, and the reason is um, when I set the value for McCarthy, I actually specified a number um, when I specified the birth year for Dennis Ritchie. I specified a string. And so now when I read the data back, I have to worry about what, what number of string. If I use an object, um, then in the definition of that class, I specify the type of the birth year. I won't make this mistake. Um, now, whenever um, we're sending a message out to the network, remember the, the long delay compared to the processor speed. Um, the reading and writing to a database from Firebase is asynchronous. Um, and so when we do a write, um, the question is, did it actually happen? 
Um, so there are a couple of ways we can deal with this. One is um, there is a completion listener and it has just one method. Let me try this. No, it's still a good way. Um, you know, there's an on complete listen method. Um, and we can use that to get notification about the results. So here's an example of doing that. Um, you know, try to get rid of all of my Java versions, but then they didn't. Um, there should be, yeah, here's the Kotlin version where I, you know, first of all, you know, I'll better go back to writing the line. You know, I subclass completion listener. Um, now when I call set value, I pass in um, the listener that I want to get to see the message back from. And then since it's this activity, here's my on complete listener. Um, and then you know, I, can, I check to see if there are any errors. Um, if, there, if there's no errors, then all I'm doing is I do it and just let myself know that it actually happened. But in the real application, we would do something if not, I know the message actually got there. Well, if the message didn't get there, we'll, we'll then try and figure out what we should do about that. Um, so the fire store, um, you know, it, is slightly better, so it scales better than using Firebase. Um, the top level is collections, they call collections, so we can think of those tables, and then collections contain documents, JSON document, but we, you know, we can think of those rows. Um, and then each a document contain fields, which um, you want to call columns and you can actually define indices. Um, and you can use either one or both in a project. And you need to add you know, dependency for Firebase. Um, the actual number here for the push numbers is out of date. I do not have time to update this slide. So here's a you know, simple example using um, Firestore. Um, you know, make instance the database. Again, just call get instance in the right class. Um, I'm creating a hash map of data to send. Um, and then basically, First, what I want to do is I want to um, add that information into a collection called cities. And in that city, I'm going to add basically a row labeled LA. Um, and then I can call, you know, set the data. And here I can then add listeners um that tell me when things are successful and tell me when something goes wrong.
So on the client side, it's slightly different, but not that much different. Again, we're talking about adding, um, instead of a tree, we've got collections. Um, and then in the database view, right, we've got, here's the cities we created. Um, here is, right, the LA and then our our fields to LA. Another example um, in creating a hash map for a person, and then I'm adding that collection to the user's state collection. And, you know, again, I'm adding another, create another user. Um, And Firestore to you know read values. Um, again, we need a reference to database. And now, what information do I want to get? So I want to get all my users. Um, so you know, put the collection users. And get all of them, I'm calling get. Um, and again, when you read from the database, it reads it on asynchronously, so you don't get locked waiting for things to respond. Um, and so I need two handlers or listeners. What, what to do when this request is handled is successful. Um, and the other one is what to do, you know, notify me when something went wrong. And so here is my um, success listener. And all I'm doing is you know, going, having a for loop to go through all the documents that were sent back to me. And then for each document, um, I want to get the ID and then the document with the actual data associated with it. Um, I'm not sure if this still exists. Um, in the past, you could look at the messages Firebase is sending back and forth. Um, I wasn't able to enable that last time, but I yesterday, but I didn't have time to check in detail, but it's very handy because it shows you what's going on when you make requests. Um, if you haven't uh, written programs that use talk to a network on a server, you just don't know how frustrated it can be when something goes wrong and you have a hard, it becomes very hard to figure out what because there are a number of different types of things that go wrong. You could have formatted the request incorrectly. Um, you were trying to connect to the wrong server. Never could be down temporarily. The server could be down temporarily. Um, the code for handling things could be wrong. So being able to see what's going on. Um, is always very, very helpful. Um, you know, so going back to Firebase instead of Firestore, um, one nice feature is that 
it can handle writes when the user is offline. You know, say you're you know, at 30,000 feet on an airplane going someplace and don't have no connection. Um, and you're using your application and you enter data. The data will be stored locally until um, the next time the user uses their application and has no connection. Um, and then the data will be uploaded to the database. Um, You know, we can order the elements in the database by giving them priorities. Um, so our set value method has various versions and one is a priority. Um, and then we'll do ordering. Um, I actually order it. Um, so it is possible. Um, you can use numeric keys, um, but those keys are always stored as strings. Um, So now we can get to some probably more complicated cases. Um, so here I have you know, class for name, and then in my person class, I have a field of type name. And, and then in my constructor, I'm creating a name object. And so what happens now is when I create my person object and save it, um, what I'm getting is my the name object is stored um, as an object in the database in terms of right. the key used is the property name and then the value is stored as the property from that from that particular object. So we can nest objects, right? So we don't have to do all one level. Okay. There are um, a number of different ways of saving data database. Um, there's set value, which will write to the database or, or overwrite data that's already there. Um, we can do an update child, um, which is used to security updating. And then there is a push where we can actually send a, a list of data to be updated. And finally, we can have a transaction where we can do a number of operations. And you have mall succeed or or non run succeed. Um, the push is useful. Um, when you might have multiple clients writing to the same location um, because the key becomes um, generated by a timestamp. The problem is if you have multiple clients using the same key, then they'll overwrite each other's data. So the push will allow you to um, generate a time, different timestamp for each 
client, so you don't have to worry about um, clients who are in the same location. Of course, one problem with that is, um, you know, so here I'm doing it. So here's my push and I'm getting my key. Um, and then um, at that key, I am setting the value. And in the database now, we're getting a general identifier for that person. Which does lead to interesting question, how do we get back to the person? Different ways of actually reading for values. Um, there's a value event listener. Um, and what that does is it should give you the current value of the data at that given path. Um, and then it will also be triggered when there's actually a um, that data changes. And there's also a child event listener. Um, the difference here is that you get, you get triggered when any child gets moved, changed, or modified. Where the value listener is only for one particular value. And the value event listener has two methods. Um, on success, you get this data snapshot object. Um, so here's an example. Um, you know, first I'm creating this value event listener. Um, I have to give it the success method and the failure method. Um, and now what I'm doing is, you know, first I need a database. Um, and then I'm getting the reference to the key I want. And then, um, I'm adding the value event listener. Um, and now when I should get the initial value and then anytime that changes, um, either my on data change method or my on cancel method should be called. Um, How are we doing? Okay, a few more minutes. Um, actually, this might be a good place to stop to see if there are any questions. Um, about the material I've covered. Um, I want you to know at least. 11 people listed should know that no more assignments, right? So we're, should be ready to focus on projects. Doesn't appear to be any questions. Um,
you know, if any of you comes across any references to why Zoom is now delaying, and I write, I'd appreciate that. And I'll be looking to try and figure out why it is when I try to change my slides or my um, start drawing, there's not all this delay. Okay, I will end it for today and hope everyone's doing well. Um, everyone's safe. And we'll see you on Thursday. All right, see you on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.